this. Thank you, colleagues. Welcome back. Please take your seats uh, and welcome you at the virtual platform as well. This uh, last session of day five on a Friday. We are now going to resume again. I am. I just need to indicate the following important points. Um, I will be inviting Advocate Mbofu and give him the last 15 minutes to wrap up his uh, cross-examination. After that, I will be opening up an opportunity for members to interact with Mr. Van Lohrenberg, who, who, who will have to leave at three. And uh, thereafter, any of those who have any brief questions they want to pose to the public protector would do so. Uh, I'm hoping to be that we're done by four uh, in all of it. And so thank you very much. We proceed. We I now recognize and hand over to Advocate um, Pofu. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I'm going to do my best, but I'm, I'm not sure if I'll finish in 15 minutes, but as I said this morning, I'm committed to assisting. Um, it, it might well be that if I'll indicate at the end, Chair, but if I'm unhappy that I should finish, but, at this, and, um, but I'm at a natural place, it might mean that the witness might have to be recalled at some other stage, then so be it. But I'll try to avoid that, yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, Mr. Van Lohenberg? Yes, Chairperson. Just want us to deal quickly with um, uh, two issues in the time that, uh, and I'll do them quickly. Well, it's in your hands. If you if, if will either do them quickly or not. Yeah. The um, issue of the equipment. Sorry, sorry, just a minute. Just want to check if a certain document was sent to my colleagues. Okay. Um, sorry, okay. Chair, I'm sorry to do this to you. Uh, uh, Ms. Bauer, there's a letter that we sent you. It's a short letter. If you can just have a look, and then you can indicate to me if you are happy that I, I won't do it now, but um, until you've indicated that I can refer to it. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> okay, no, let's leave that for now, uh, Mr. Van Lohenberg. Oh, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come back to it. You do accept. Oh, okay, no, maybe accept is a strong word here. You do understand that the public protector's um, approach and conclusions and findings are that the unit was rogue, among other things, because it breached the intelligence legislation, as well as the Constitution. I think we went through that earlier, including the Interception Act. There's some act with a long name that I can't deal with it now, but inter Interception and Removal of whatever Act. Let's just call it Intelligence Legislation. You accept that? Yes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> right. Now, I'm just going to put a proposition to you again to avoid any toing and throwing. There's a letter which is an attachment to um, all these cases, and it's 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 well known. I'm sure you, you have come across it as well. Yeah, which um, 
was written by Minister Godan to Minister Trevor Manuel uh, on the 22nd of February, 2007. That would be around the time of the establishment of the unit. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yes, Chair. Yes. This is where the funds are requested. Absolutely, yes. Yes, that's the one, yeah. We'll try and put it and identify and put it up, Chair, but it, it's already in the system. We, 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 I'm just trying to save time, yeah. <clears throat> okay, I would have gone through this letter in detail, but let me just give you what my, con my conclusions are around it and you can confirm or dispute. This letter, in essence, says this, and I'm paraphrasing, so don't hold me to it um, with a gun on my head. <laughs> it says, Dear Minister Manuel, we in SARS require capability to do um, intelligence work. The terms are infiltrate and penetrate, Chair. Infiltrate and penetrate, yeah, well, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, but, but uh, on the understanding that that constitutes uh, intelligence work, and yeah. therefore, and that work is outside of the mandate of SARS. And therefore... Yes, the infiltration and penetration is indeed outside. Th thank you, thank you, yes, indeed. And, and therefore, we would like to have money allocated to NIA as the National Intelligence Agency, so that a unit housed at NIA can then be used to satisfy our needs because it falls under them in terms of legislation. As I say, I'm paraphrasing, but would you agree that that's a gist of what was being proposed? That was a proposal at the time, yes, Chair, I recall it quite distinctly. What should be read with that document is the draft um, operational agreement um, on the NIA side and then the legal opinions on the NIA side, the National Intelligence Agency side. Yes. In respect of that concept that that letter sought to create. But, uh, that's fine. That, what you are referring to now just, is... Just hold on to the profile. Um. Ah, sorry, sorry, I took it from coffee. I don't want no to problem. interrupt you, but I don't have that letter you referred to. Bundle A, page four three seven O. Okay, I'll send it to you on WhatsApp in the meantime. No, no, it's fine. It's four three seven O bundle yeah. A. Then the person can put it up on the sorry. Okay, and you can put it up on the screen for. Members as well. Okay, so enough that that will happen. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm just saying I can send it to you on WhatsApp as well if that will take time. In, in the meantime, okay. Thank you, thank you, Miss Power. Yeah, the document you are referring to um, is a document, and again, because of time, I hope we will we'll not quibble about it because you have, as you say, you are familiar with it. That document is called agreement, or let's call it a draft agreement as you call it, between the National Intelligence Agency and South African Revenue Services for a cooperation between NIA and SARS and is dated um, 17th September 2002 uh, and it's a um, uh, attached to the, to the letter on this version as PG6, which probably means Pravin Godan 6 in one or other litigation here. But uh, uh, that's no, the- not that, It's not that document I'm referring to, Chair. Not that one. Okay, fine. That's fine. No, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, if I can try and be brief, there's, there's there were several memoranda of understanding and operational agreements be between the South African Revenue Service and the intelligence agencies and law enforcement agencies over many years. This yes. is one example. Yes. This remained in place. I think it still remains in place to this day, unless it's been um, brought to a, a close. Cancelled or whatever. Yeah, no, fine. Yes. 
Okay. We can go back to the letter. Yes. And uh, the... The, oh, to the letter, yes. Okay, fine. Let me read it out so, so to save time. 2.1 of the letter says, collecting tactical intelligence invariably means penetrating and intercepting um, organized criminal syndicates. This is an activity for which SARS does not presently have cap capability, including the legislative mandate to manage clandestine activity. Right. Yeah. Okay, now the point I'm making for the purposes of this commission, I don't want to get into all that, is that the public protector came to the view that the activities of the unit that had been, that were understood by her to, to be taking place in respect of those eight sources that we spoke about earlier. Uh, were in contravention, not just of the constitution, but also of the relevant legislation, intelligence legislation, to use the general term. Do you agree with that? Yes, sir. Thank you. And again, that is, uh, her, um, that's how she came to the conclusion of, of so-called uh, rogueness. Okay, thank you. Uh, if you agree on that, um, then... No, no, Chair, just a point yes. in response um, to the question. This document does not relate to the unit that the public protector investigate, um, Chairperson. This document relates to a series of planning sessions and interactions between the then National Intelligence Agency and the South African Revenue Service in the years 2005 until this letter came about, where it was agreed that there will be a capacity within the National Intelligence Agency dedicated to assist the South African Revenue Service to intercept and infiltrate um, organized crime syndicates. And that, that refers to things like use of agents and undercover operatives and that sort of thing. And that um, the revenue service would effectively ensure payment for the first three years of the creation of such a capacity within the National Intelligence Agency. So if you look at paragraph 2.4, there were estimated personnel costs for um, three years forecast. Um, and that was in, 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 in consultation with the National Intelligence Agency. Uh, on the flip side, within the National Intelligence Agency, there will be similar documents speaking to the same thing. Um, but it, it was never seen through. In other words, this, this document, for instance, is a document that seeks funding from Treasury to be directed to um, the National Intelligence Agency the funding was never released. It was approved, but it never occurred because the funding was never released. The unit was never created and it died a death. Yes. It should not be confused with the, the special projects unit. Okay, Mr. As it was known in that yeah. time. Thank you. Believe me, that long answer is not necessary. I'm, I'm really trying to save time here. The only point I'm making, uh, Mr. Van Lochenberg, actually, uh, the I think it was Mr. Godin, one of the people involved in this, their version, to paraphrase, is that um, Nia lost appetite and it was not carried through, like you are saying. So uh, I'm not there. Uh, uh, the, that is common cause between you and me. The, the only, uh, do, do you understand that? Yes, Jay. Yes. So the only thing I'm saying to you is a very simple one, which is that the in coming to her conclusions, the public protector, among other things, considered this letter and the fact that it was suggesting at the time, admittedly, something that would would have been in breach of the law. I mean, that should be obvious. The, the only reason that SARS... I understand, Chairperson. 
Yes. The, 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 My the, response the, is the error is that this letter does not relate to the unit that she expressed findings on. Uh, okay, I'm, uh, I'm, um, I'm going to try again. Mr. Van Lokhamberg, the issue is that she might have wrongly relied the letter might be talking about a soccer game or whatever i'm not there i'm saying to you do you accept that among the material that led the public protector rightly or wrongly or whatever you think about that that uh, led the public protector to her conclusions was the fact that in this letter the mr godan was implicitly, you know, not emphatically or explicitly, was implicitly um, acknowledging that 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 was being proposed would have been illegal to be done at SARS. Hence, they were asking Nia to cooperate. That's all. That she considered that this letter as part of the material. Do you accept that? If she did, I accept that, okay? Okay, thank you. Okay. It's 4171. Four, so, Chair, that's bundle A. Bundle A4171. Um, I know you've accepted it, but just for the record for the committee, in Mr. Kodan's affidavit, Chair, 73.3, he says, in a memorandum dated 2 February 2007, Mr. Pillay and I, sought ministerial approval for the establishment of this, this, this SARS investigative unit within NIA. Ministerial approval was sought and obtained only because the proposal to establish the SARS investigative unit with, within the NIA would have required a transfer of funds from SARS to NIA. Um, yes, the, so the, that's all really I'm saying, uh, um, and, and I will do, don't worry about detail. I'll, I'll deal with Mr. P, with this with Mr. Pillay as well. So that's why I'm. I'm I accept I'm, that. Yeah. You accept that. Thank you. And I don't want to mislead you that you accept two things at the same time. You accept my real proposition, which was that um, the public project I relied entirely on this letter. Oh, I don't you, know. Uh, no, if, if that is the submission. So, sorry, 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 sir. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, I, I don't know, uh, Jay. If that is the submission of the public protector, I have no reason to doubt that. All right. Well, if you if you, you have read the public protector's report, you will know that you don't have to do it now, but. In your own time over the weekend, you must go to 4.4.1.18 of the Public Protector's Report. This is the part chair I was looking for earlier. And while I'm at it, let, uh, okay, let me kill one bed for now. That the item there says a copy of a memorandum from SARS to the former Minister of Finance, Mr. Trevor Manuel, dated 7th, February 2007. That is this document. That's listed as one of the documents upon which the public protector relied uh, for her conclusion. So that, that that's not something that it can be in contention for anyone who has read the report. Agreed? Agreed, Chair. Thank you. <clears throat> And Chair, the earlier point I wanted to make about this, <clears throat> I might as well make it now in the form of a proposition summarized for you, for uh, custom purpose for, to try and speed up Mr. Um, Van Lohende. That section of the report is called 4.4.1. And this, uh, let me warn you already wh wh why I'm doing this so that when you answer it, you, you know where I'm going. The, one of the um, conclusions by you and the court, the three judges in, the, in this particular matter, is that, and I think you said this yesterday or the other day, 
actually there was no investigation. This was just all a sham and um, going through the motions because the decision had already been taken. Am I summarizing it correctly? Predetermined outcome. No, I've never said that. Chair. Okay. Do, do, do you think that? I have, a, I have suspicions, but I, I'm, I'm not comfortable in expressing suspicions when I lack facts. I won't do what's been done on to me. No, that's good enough. I know you've never said it, but I know you think it, yeah. So, all right. So, the, the, the point I, I simply want to make now is <clears throat> there's a list, <clears throat> excuse me, of um, something like that list goes from... <clears throat> 4.4.1.1, I can't read all of them, we'll be here all day. And that includes letters to the president, letters to the public, pro, uh, to the uh, o inspector general, letter to the minister, letter to Mr. Mahashula, letter to the South African Ag uh, Security Agency, acting SARS commissioner, and so on, a, a, a list of and recordings and, and so on, and uh, um, letters to Minister Manuel, uh, notices in terms of seven, nine, something like 40 to 50 items. And those are the items that show the journey that the public protector uh, traveled with this matter. And my, the proposal I want to put to you is that I'm going to argue at the end, and I'm giving you an opportunity to comment that that alone is an indication of, as I said earlier this morning, the lengths to which she went, and that to suggest that there was actually no investigation, this was just some plaything, is absurd. What do you say to that? I say that um, <clears throat> one should reflect on um, what was put on oath by me before court um, in respect of the content of uh, the report by the public protector. Um, and if only uh, the public protector engaged any one of those uh, 33 people um, that I had mentioned earlier, um, they would have been able to assist her um, to not make the errors that were made in the report. That, that's my response. Um. Sorry, okay. Uh, all right. Uh, I, I missed that response for some reason, but I, 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 uh, it's fine. I say, if only, you know, there's a documentary review. Uh -huh. um, if only she had, um, she had done, which is what I'm complaining about, which is if only she had spoken to the implicated people. Um, between all of us, we would have been able to clarify for her those errors that she ultimately made. She would not have made those. Um, yes, but it's all contained in the court papers before the court, which were also not disputed by her. Yes. Uh, no, that's fine. I, I don't want us to go there. Again, I think we're done with that. You, you, you accept that she, she interacted with uh, Mr. Gordon, the so-called pro most prominent person, correct? Yes, I said she interacted with, of the people I listed, she interacted with at least the first three, being Mr. Gordon, Mr. Pillay, and Mr. Mahashula. Yes, and it's common cause that she did not interact with you because she could not find you, or the, the, her people could not find you. We, we accept that. So I don't want to go back to that. All okay. the other 33 people associated with the unit. <clears throat> yeah, well, she's the public protector, um, you know, she's uh, her primary concern is the, that's why I talked about primary people. For example, there's uh, the act called the Executive uh, Management Ethics Act. It only applies to Mr. Godan. It wouldn't apply to you. That doesn't mean you are less important. It just doesn't apply to you. Do you accept that? Yes, Chair. I, I think I've answered your question um, as best as I could, Chair. No, that's fine. All right. The the and and I'm saying, Mr. Van Lochem, but just so that you can have a, a, a peaceful weekend. Well, the statement that you make, let's say in the ideal world, she could have spoken to what did you say, 33 people or whatever. <clears throat> let's Any, say she could, anyone in the unit, Jane. Anyone yes. in the unit at the time. Yes. 
your point is that if she was able to speak to all those people and was able to reach them, the, Not the all some those in the know. No, let's say all of them. Let's make it even worse. Yeah, if she could speak to all of them, then the report would have been um, the. Uh, qualitatively better. That's what you are saying. She would not have made the errors that the court found to have been made. A well, simple thing, Jay, like calling Mr. Manike an employee of the unit and then accepting everything he says of the unit as if he was a member of the unit. Um, yes. This letter that you've just put up is another example. There are many. Yes. No, that's fine. That, that's, uh, no, don't worry about that. The courts have said she's human and I think we believe the court. Uh, like all of us, if she makes a mistake by calling Mr. Manyiga, whatever you are saying, that, that's not mis impeachable conduct. That's not the point I'm making. I'm saying your overall point really is that if she had spoken, and I'm exaggerating for effect, if she had speak, spoken to all the 33 people, the report would have been qualitatively better, which any right-minded person must accept. That's what you're saying. It would have been uh, it would have been without the errors contained in it. Yes, Mr. Van Dochenberg, if it doesn't have those errors, would it be better or worse? It would be better. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so thank, thank you, Advocate and uh, Um Please throw your last... Uh, the, uh, last uh, point. Okay, yes. fine. I'll leave that uh, topic then. I think anyway, we've done justice to it. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> then, if we can then quickly go to the um, <clears throat> the letter. Can it be put up? I think I gave the page number. Okay, anyway. Mm -mm. I'm just going to ask you about it. You may or may not be aware of this. <clears throat> but, and, and again, I don't want to have a long debate with you. If, if it looks like we're going to have a long debate, uh, we will raise it with Mr. Pillay, because he would, unlike you, he would have had proper warning of the letter. So, but I just want you to, is it up? Oh, okay, it's not on. This is a letter written on the 18th February 2021 to Advocate Mkwebane from SARS by the current commissioner for SARS, um, Mr. Kisweta, regarding, just for your assistance, regarding the question of the equipment. Are you aware, of, there you are. Are you aware of this letter? Just run it to the end, just to show the date. Can you see it, Mr. Van Lochenberg? Yes, I can see it. Thank no, you. I've never seen it before. You are not aware. Okay, good. Okay, in that case, I'll just give you, I'll ask you to just comment on one thing and I'll say I'll converse it with Mr. Pillay. Paragraph, okay, let me quickly read it, Chair. Dear Advocate Nkwebane, uh, it says Advocate Nkwebane, the public protector. There's even a debate about that. Uh, okay, it's number one, I trust you are well that, and that you have started 2021 on a positive note, on a positive and constructive note. Uh, two, and this is the paragraph I want you to comment on. I wish to inform you <clears throat> that SARS will be vacating its premises at River Walk Office Park on 31st May 2021. You may recall that the equipment that formed part of the public protector's investigation into the alleged so-called rogue unit was securely stored in the basement of the said premises under supervision of the DPCI, <clears throat> sorry, and the SSA, stop. SARS will be relocating that equipment to a few, uh, rather, a new secure location under the supervision of the South African Police Service and the SSA at a date to be determined. Three, you are most welcome to send representatives 
to oversee the relocation, should you decide to do so, it would be appreci appreciated if my office could be alerted to make the necessary arrangements. If we don't hear, if we don't hear from you, to the contrary, from the office prior to 15 May 2021, in this regard, SARS will proceed with the relocation. Kind regards. Very nice letter indeed. But yes, um, you. yes. <clears throat> but for, for for the purposes of 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 your of our interaction, I just want to to alert you to two things. One is that <clears throat> there was some equipment which was uh, there were cl clearly some equipment that was that belonged to the so-called rogue unit, which was securely stored at, at the basement of some building, and that. No, I disagree. Uh, yeah. oh, well, okay. Uh, you, okay, uh, let me read this again. You may recall <clears throat> that the equipment that formed part of the public protector's investigation. <clears throat> excuse me, into the alleged so-called rogue unit was securely stored yes. in the basement of the said premises under the supervision of DPSA and SSA. I, is Mr. Kiswata lying here? No, Chair, he's referring to the equipment that is um, contained in the photographs in the Rule 53 record of the of the review application, and the, that equipment's got nothing to do with the unit that was investigated. Uh, it, in fact, it's the equipment that that is listed in um, um, the KPMG report. No, in, in paragraph one nine eight of uh, the judgment, the three sets of equipment. Yes. Mr. Van Lochenbeck, please, uh, are you going to make a war between me and the chairperson? I'm saying, I, I accept, let's say I accept everything you're saying, but I'm Thank saying you. you cannot say that the, the except for the part where you say that the, it has nothing to do with the unit, because that can only be true if Mr. Kisweta is, is making it up. He says, you may recall that the equipment that formed part of the public protector's investigation into the alleged so-called rogue unit was securely stored in the basement of the said premises under supervision of DPS. Whether that was a teaspoon or a surveillance, whatever, I don't Yeah, care. I understand exactly. I think um, Mr. Mpofu is not understanding me. I accept that equipment was kept in secure storage in the basement at Riverwalk offices under the supervision of the DPCI and the State Security Agency. I accept that. Um, yes. It dates back to February 2015. All right, thank what you. What I don't accept is um, the second part of what Mr. Mpofu is putting to me, Chairperson, which is that this is the equipment that belonged to the road unit. It did not. None of the people in the high-risk investigation units ever seen that equipment in their entire life, let alone use it. Yes. But then that's not a criticism yes. of Mr. Mpofu. That's what I'm saying. Then that's a criticism of Mr. Kiswata because that's he's he who says this in the letter. No, I read it completely different. But it's an, it's a, I don't think it's going to advance anything. So I read I read that, it as a matter of courtesy. Thank okay. you. Thank no, no, you. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm Mr. Sorry, Chair. I'd like to hear what what uh, Mr. Van Lochrenberg has to say here. I'd yeah. like to hear his complete answer, if I may. Yeah. Why do you disturb the chair? Seriously. Sorry, chair, because because Advocate Mpofu was not letting Mr. Van Lochrenberg finish his answer. No, I'd, chairperson. I'd really like to hear. Uh, please, 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 please stop. I was on the platform as a chairperson, and and you don't know what I was doing. Because when I started this session, I made an announcement. You were not here. Please. <laughs> I want you to wrap up now, Advocate Chair, Bofu. I've, I've, I've given 15 minutes and beyond that. Chair, um, thank you. You know that I'm, you can see that I'm trying yes, please. to assist you. Uh, but Chair, I do need your protection. I cannot be abused. I've, al I've already had, uh, uh, attended to okay. that. Okay, all right. All right. So, um, yes. Uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Van Lorchenberg, if, if uh, I was not interrupting you uh, to, uh, to, to be rude. I'm simply trying to move 
with the ruling of the chair that we must try and give the members an opportunity. I've jumped a whole lot of things here. And I'm all at the same time trying to avoid having to recall you, Mr. Van Lochenberg. So I'm really trying to assist the, 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 the process. Um, the, I've now lost my train of thought here. Yeah. I, say, I was saying, Mr. Van Lochenberg, I'm making a simple proposition. And to be fair, you've answered it, that you read it differently. That then will be a matter for argument. But for the record, the only point I was making to you is that it is not me, because you're saying you disagree with Mr. Mpofu. I'm, I'm reading to you, it's signed not Mr. Mpofu here. It's signed Edward Kisweta. And it is he who says, who described it as the, the rather, equipment that form part of the public project as investigation into the alleged so-called rogue unit. Not me, as long as we're clear on that. Yes, it's the, it's the very same uh, equipment listed in, the, in report 36 of 2019-20. All right, I give up. Thank so, you, thank you, uh, Advocate Booth. Uh, I think uh, that's where we're stopping. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, well, you. I reserve my right then, Chair, to recall the witness if we have to come to thank, that. Thank, thank Again, you. as I say, just for your comfort, Chair, I will do my best if there are topics that I haven't covered to cover them with Mr. Pillay, uh, because they basically deal with the same thing, so that we avoid having to call Mr. Van Rockham back. But I'm, I'm reserving my rights. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Mpofu. Uh, Mr. Van Lochenbeck, uh, before yes. we finish you with three, I am now going to invite and recognize uh, the honorable members of the committee to interact uh, briefly with you. Um, so be ready for that. Thank May you. May I uh, we start at the virtual. Um, it will be Honorable Zungula, uh, followed by Zagude uh, and Mananiso. Any hands here? Honorable Maneli. Heron, Sukas, Milan, Van Minen, Gondwe, Nodada, Mkweba, in that order. Honorable, Honorable Zungula. Thank you, uh, Chairperson. Um, afternoon. Uh, to... Can I proceed, ahead, Honorable Zungula. Okay, um, afternoon and afternoon to the, to you, Chair, Honorable Members and the witness. Um, my first question will, is, how much was spent in procuring the so-called spying equipment? Um, I think you would know what I'm talking about. Secondly, in the annual performance plan, did you disclose the nature of the equipment in the sense that was this expenditure openly disclosed to the National Treasury and the National Treasury knowingly authorized the budget? My third question is which SARS regulation gave authority for the purchase of the so-called spying equipment. My last question is, are you aware of the engagements between SARS and SSA on surveillance issues? Why did this engagement not result in SSA cooperating with SARS in the manner proposed by SARS? That is all, Chair. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if the, the, the witness has captured all of the questions because it is four straightforward questions. Okay, just uh, um, if the honourable member can just repeat the last question for me, please. Are you aware of the engagement between SARS and SSA on the surveillance issues? 
why did this engagement not result in SSA cooperating with SARS in the manner proposed by SARS? Uh, just to clarify the last question, is this uh, in relation to um, back in 2007, uh, Honourable Member? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Honourable Zungula. Um, Mr. Van Lochenberg, you got that. Would you want to proceed? Yes, Chair. Go ahead. In, in, in my time in the South African Revenue Service, I've never participated in the acquisition of spying equipment for any of the units that I managed. So uh, the answer would be zero, RAN. Um, all equipment um, of any unit that I ever managed or participated in or worked with um, had to submit um, uh, not just during the planning phase, but during the internal audit and Auditor General of South Africa um, asset audits. We had to account for everything. So every item assigned to a unit or a component or a division or whatever had to be barcoded um, and reflected on an asset register. Um, I, I don't know which SAPS, which SARS regulation, um, because I've never had to, um, I've never had to make an application of that kind. Um, and I, yes, I am aware of the in, engagements between SARS and it was uh, then not yet known as the State Security Agency yet, um, honorable member. Um, it, it wasn't so much on surveillance issues per se, it was more a case of um, having a dedicated ability within the National Intelligence Agency to assist the South African Revenue Service at that point in time in dealing with the illicit economy in ways in which the South African Revenue Service was not able to. There was a change of guard around the same time. Um, and so um, at least, uh, well, there were still hopes that it would eventually um, happen, and I still believe it ought to. But um, uh, for some reason, I think ministers changed and director generals changed and so forth. And the entire matter just uh, uh, went, came to naught. Thank you, honorable member, and thank you, chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, honorable uh, Zungola. Honorable Lagude. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Good uh, afternoon to you, the public protector and, his, and her team, and also our witness, uh, the Mr. Lochenbeck. Honorable Chairperson, uh, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. My apologies. Let me switch off my video so that I can uh, be audible. Honorable Chairperson, I want to ask who our witness, Mr. Lochenbeck, on, your, on his uh, affidavit, paragraph five, he was requested by the, ev by the evidence leader who uh, advocate Bauer to elaborate further on what he said on paragraph five. And while he was doing so, he indicated that from 2009 to 2014, the so-called rogue unit was under attack, there was bullying and firing of people. My question there is, who was doing that? Was it internal uh, people, their bosses, or was it from outside? If you can uh, respond to that. And also yesterday, while he was being questioned, he also mentioned that he was responsible for Five, for five units, including the so-called rogue unit. 
were all those, uh, the other four units subjected to the same uh, treatment as the so-called rogue unit? If not, what could, what could be the reasons for that? Then, Honorable Chairperson, there is a continuous mentioning of the IGI report. So, and also the name of uh, the former IGI, uh, Dr. Dintwe, keeps on popping up. So I want to understand if uh, the report that is being referred to as the IGI report was then a report that was compiled by uh, the former IGI, Dr. Dinto. And also on the court application by uh, Mr. Lochenbeck and others, I want to know from him if the IGI did oppose the, that application in court? If not, what could be the reasons for that? And coupled with that, Honorable Chair, I want to know if the IGI did investigate, as per the Skakane report, that was in that report of Skakane. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair for the opportunity. Thank you. Uh, did you get all of those questions, Mr. Van Lochenberg? I think so. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Member. Please go ahead. Um, Honorable Member, I, and with respect to my paragraph five, I did not um, say that the, uh, the unit came under attack. I, I said that the portion of the revenue service responsible for law enforcement and um, uh, came under attack and increasingly under attack from those years. Um, uh, where those attacks came from were from multiple quarters. They came predominantly from those persons or individuals or companies, uh, people associated with the companies um, or business entities that were under investigation by um, or, or un, in prosecution or what under order by the respective components within the law enforcement um, uh, division within the revenue service um, initially. And then I also listed in some instances, um, as these attacks increased, it began to include um, certain uh, individuals within law enforcement, the state intelligence agencies, um, organized crime, gangs, and so on. And in some instances, those relationships were, um, excuse me, um, symbiotic. Um, and then um, ultimately, some of the attacks were also um, then advanced by um, some people who had left the institution and their friends who remained within the institution. Um, the, the four other units that I managed, um, uh, Honorable Member, I, I describe them in quite some detail in my um, affidavits before uh, that, that I submitted to the Commission. Um, none were treated in the same fashion as this particular small little unit. Um, and I honestly cannot tell you why I think that's the case. Um, I would have to speculate, but I do think um, it, it has some uh, something to do with some of the 81 um, investigations that they were uh, that they that that they had done and were still busy with um, uh, around that period. Um, the the Inspector General report that um, that that was discussed during um, uh, evidence was in fact signed off uh, under the um, Inspector General that preceded Dr. Dinkwe, which was um, Ms. Uh, Faith Khadebe, the late Ms. Faith Khadebe uh, uh, ambassador. 
um, and not Dr. Bintwe. Um, in um, my application to um, review and set aside that report, um, as indicated in the, in the annexure that I think was provided to the committee um, under case number 91160 of 2019, um, the, uh, both the Inspector General and the Minister of State Security um, initially opposed my application. Um, by filing notices of intention to oppose. Um, they then failed to um, provide the Rule 53 record, even after I'd given them additional time to do so. Um, and then I filed my final affidavit and wanted to place the matter on the court roll. And it's at that point then that their attorneys contacted mine and what resulted from that was um, the consent order as provided to the committee. Um, did the Inspector General investigate what was in the Sikakane report? Well, um, I, I don't know, actually, um, Honourable Member and Chairperson, because I've never seen the Rule 53 record of that um, process. Um, all I can say is that um, the the Inspector General of Intelligence report of 2014 was concluded prior to the conclusion of the Sikakane report by about five days, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the Sikakane report is dated 5 November, whereas the IGI report is dated 31st October of the same year, 2014. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Van Lachenberg. Mananiso. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me start by uh, welcoming the witness before us and as well greet the public protector and advocate in Bofu and as well the parliament team. Uh, Chair, I would like to start with a comment. Uh, with regards to the affidavit of uh, J, uh, Mr. JVL. Uh, I hope that indeed he came before us based on what he has indicated on his affidavit on page one, paragraph four, and I hope that there are no motives behind. I have only three questions for, for, for him, and it's based on his affidavit. My first question, Chair, is on page three, paragraph 7.6. You stated that adverse findings were made against the, the advocate Mkwebani in her capacity as PP. Please name one or perhaps two. Number two, paragraph four, uh, page four, actually, paragraph 7.11. You indicated to the House that you were, yeah, uh, you actually, you know, you are a whistleblower. So I want to check what could have motivated you to be the whistleblower in this particular uh, 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 moment. Uh, lastly, Chair, my last question is on page five to eight with reference to paragraph 7.12.4. How would you classify your working relationship with the PP? Because from page five to eight, you, you, you can tell that uh, you don't have a good relationship with the public protector. And further, can you just give us a view in terms of how can you classify her leadership? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Mananiso. Mr. Van Lohenberg. Um, adverse findings, Honorable Member and Chairperson, with uh, examples would be 458, uh, sorry, 48521 of 2019. That's um, uh, that's uh, one court judgment that made adverse findings against uh, Ms. Mukwebane. Uh, another example would be, I'm just taking off from what's been provided, uh, uh, the 36099. 
um, of 2019, which is another case number uh, where the court made adverse findings against Ms. Mukwebane. Um, yeah, those would be examples, um, honorable member. Um, what motivated me to be a whistleblower? I undertook, um, when I resigned from the revenue service in 2015, uh, to those colleagues of mine who were in a terrible state of trauma, that I will not rest until justice is served and the truth is known about the good work done. Um, because at that point in time, they were under absolute, absolute public humiliation and siege. That remains my motivation. Um, my primary motivation at a broader level, I set out in paragraph three of my affidavit to this committee. Um, I have no relationship with the public protector or the office of the public protector whatsoever. And I have no view on the leadership of Ms. Mukwebane as the public protector because I just simply do not know her and have never interacted with her. Thank you, Chairperson and Honourable Member. Thank you, Mr. Van Lauren, um, Honourable Heron. Thanks, Chairperson. Chairperson, I have um, um, some questions in terms of Directive 5.9 that I would like to ask the ad advocate in Kobani. So, shall I do that later and yes, deal with Mr. Van Rothenberg? Keep that, okay. Okay, please. Um, I would like to just follow that it's really partially covered. My first question to Mr. Van Lochenberg is the role of a whistleblower that um, he claims from August 2016. Um, when, 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 when you approached the, the public protector, Mr. Van Lochenberg, in 2016, were you lodging a complaint, as is contemplated in terms of the Public Protector Act, asking her, um, the incumbent at the time, in, in any event, to investigate a specific complaint that you had? And what was the nature of that complaint? I don't really understand what a whistleblower is who goes to the public protector. From my, from my understanding and from the legislation and my own use of the Public Protector's Office, you start a complaint by lodging. You, you start the process by lodging a complaint. So did you, in fact, lodge a complaint that you wanted investigated by the Public Protector, and what was it? Thank you, Honourable Member. Well, well, no, he's, 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 not, he's, not he's not done, he's not done, Mr. Van Lohenberg. Okay. Sorry, I've got to See, find my he, questions he's, he's got some nice pauses. Please allow him to continue. <laughs> continue, Honorable Aaron. I'm just trying to find. Something. It's been it's been three days. I yes. can understand uh, um, in terms of the notes. I, I just wanted to, to go back to the um, to the evidence around lawful surveillance, because Mr. Van Lachenberg spoke about the unit conducting lawful surveillance, which involved sometimes staking out robberies. Um, and acting when those robberies related to tax matters. Um, I, I'm not sure what I understand. It, it, maybe you can explain what lawful surveillance is, but also where would the unit have gotten the information as to what the robbery, what, what robbery was going to take place in what place? I don't understand that evidence and what the unit was actually doing um, in terms of lawful, lawful surveillance. Um, I think I am almost done, Chairperson. It's okay. Take your time. Um, <laughs> last, there is a question. Oh, yeah, my final question, Mr. Van Lachenberg, is you, in the in the affidavit and in, in, in the attachment you write, and it relates to the YouTube video in in the main. Um, your your attorneys at the time, Weber Wenzel, write to the public protector. Um, requesting an apology or demanding an apology um, and threatening um, to pursue action if it's not, if a, an apology and a withdrawal of some of the rogue unit comments is not made, um, threatening to um, sue for defamation. And I'm wondering if you pursued that because Senego attorneys wrote back and, and have said that they would not be issuing an apology. Um, so did, did you pursue litigation against the public protector for defamation, and if not, why not? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Honorable Heron. 
Uh, Ms. Stefan Lachenberg, you got those questions. Please proceed. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson and uh, Honorable Member. Uh, honor, uh, Honorable Member, I did not lodge a complaint um, in the manner in which you uh, described in 2016 with the public protector. I approached the public protector because I was by that time aware that uh, the, the public protector was busy conducting an investigation into state capture. And what I had hoped to do was to provide um, the Office of the Public Protector with uh, additional information that I had personal knowledge of in relation to the South African Revenue Service and related events, um, which I had hoped would be taken up into that um, state capture investigation. Um, lawful surveillance, well, um, I gave an example of um, uh, uh, one of the state warehouses. Now, um, the Revenue Service um, oversees multiple warehouses um, where in which uh, detained goods or seized goods or forfeited goods, um, often of very high value, are kept all over the country. Um, it's part of their statutory duty. Um, the example I gave you is is, is but one um, investigation that they worked on. In that particular case, they worked closely with uh, the South African Police Service. Um, so it wasn't the unit per se that responded to the, um, to the robbery. Uh, the, the police official did. Um, uh, what happened in that particular case in a broad sense, because I'm, I'm wary of my um, oath of secrecy, is that uh, somebody gave information to the South African Revenue Service via uh, the suspicious activity report system that existed at the time. That information led to the identification of um, someone who was able to provide additional information. Um, and then the purpose was really just to go and place the people uh, around the um, uh, uh, state warehouse uh, for that period in the event that the information that was provided proved to be true. It did prove to be true and in that case then the police came and to the, if, if I remember correctly, six people were arrested ultimately and they were trying to break into the premises and steal um, high value goods. Um, I can just also say that there is a legal opinion um, that was provided to the Revenue Service in that respect um, that I can make available should you be interested in that. But that's the kind of um, surveillance that uh, that I was referring to. Um, on the YouTube matter, indeed, I, I did want to pursue the, um, the, the, um, the legal matter against um, the Public Protector's Office. Um, uh, but events overtook um, overtook the situation for me because shortly thereafter the report came out and um, yeah, then I was besieged with the report. Um, at the time, the attorneys acted pro bono for me and um, the understanding was that if I uh, really wanted to pursue the matter, I would have to um, uh, put up some funding. Um, and there were questions around um, how exactly I should go about doing so. Um, I just simply didn't have the resources of time and I was also besieged with um, other events in my personal life. Thank you, Chair and Honourable Member. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Herman. Honourable Sukas. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I want to start by thanking Mr. Van Lochenberg for his courage um, to appear before the committee and to put his testimony before us, especially in light of, of your physical discomfort. I also on the record want to apologize to you because I was greatly disturbed by the fact that I believe we crossed the line um, by you having to explain your medical condition here um, to us and to the rest of South Africa listening in. And I want to commend you for the courage that you have um, to address, um, to speak 
on your medical condition and also to speak on behalf of other people that are similarly, similarly uh, afflicted. I, I want to um, ask you only three questions. And the first is, um, if you could describe to the committee the work of the high-risk unit and why it was referred to as the high-risk unit, what uh, was the risks? In your view, what was the value of this unit to SARS? And I note that you, you said that as a manager, you have as a manager, you have expressed concern for the impact on the staff of the high-risk units. Um, could you reflect to this committee on the personal cost to yourself and to your staff and what it has cost you personally, financially, and the impact on your career and the rest of your term, a team, since uh, this investigation into you and the unit um, from the start of the investigation up until today? Thank you. Thank you. Please respond, uh, Mr. Van Lochenberg. Mr. Chairperson and Honorable Member, thank you for your kind words. Um, to describe a unit, um, in effect, um, it was intended to um, conduct um, those parts of the investigations and financial investigations and criminal investigations and audits that we were conducting, focusing on um, sectors with, uh, within the illicit economy in our country, um, where ordinary um, auditors and investigators um, felt very uncomfortable in um, working because of the threat to um, life and limb and also um, just fear. Um, I recall, for instance, how the unions um, wanted us to begin to pay um, everybody uh, um, danger pay and um, buy them bulletproof vests and bulletproof vehicles and so forth at the time, which would have been just simply uh, not affordable. And at the same time, um, the, the, the demand on the South African Revenue Service to assist um, other law enforcement agencies and um, intelligence agencies uh, to address crime and organized crime increased uh, tremendously. Um, and so we were caught in a situation where, um, you know, people plan to bomb my office, for instance, to get rid of evidence. Um, I recall around that time how one of our investigators was um, uh, shot at in his driveway. Um, how another investigator was murdered in his driveway, was killed. Um, uh, the fact is that as the revenue service over the years became more effective in addressing these hardcore organized crime types, um, it was not um, easy for them anymore to just bribe their way through or threaten their way through or so on, it, it, it escalated and the risk increased um, significantly. Um, the, the, so that the, the, the benefit is obvious in that it enabled us to use a small, more precise um, investigative capacity to do certain things that were considered to be um, uh, risky. Um, but at the same time, it also enabled us to um, apply what we, from a, a strategy perspective, called the width, depth, and leverage strategy, which was to dedicate resources to focus on certain matters, um, regardless of the time it might take or regardless of the challenges um, that we took. And then lastly, it, it was a support unit that also assisted um, the law enforcement agencies and intelligence agencies upon their request. Um, once it was approved. Um, um, well, the value to SARS, I think, I think one should just reflect on, on sort of figures. Um, you know, if you take into account, you're talking about a unit that comprised of 26 people in year one. By the end of year two, they were down to um, a, a seven, 
Um, and for the remainder of the period, there were six people, six human beings only at the revenue server. Um, that led to, um, for example, probably the biggest um, uh, the seizure of illicit tobacco in the history of, of all customs and, and tax authorities in the world to this day, one single seize, seizure. Um, the, the way in which they worked was that they were effectively, well, firstly, I should say they worked very much like um, most people worked during um, lockdown. Um, and in a sense, how we are now communicating. Um, they had hot desks initially, and um, they weren't necessarily required to come into the office every single day and sit there in the office. Um, they were what, what was coined field workers. Um, and the, the tasks that they were given were divided into three categories of investigations. One was to focus on sectors within the illicit economy that were identified in the strategy as high risk. Examples would be illicit drugs, um, abalone, CITES products, um, clothing, textile, um, and so forth. Um, so, and, and those investigations were categorized as um, uh, type A investigations, and, and, and there it was more giving us a sense of how big is this problem and where are the we are the bad guys. A type B investigation of project was subject specific. So that was where they were investigating a specific person. In fact, in the court papers, I make reference to a mafia um, boss who's since been um, uh, um, convicted and he's serving uh, prison, uh, serving time in prison. And um, uh, type C, uh, project was just a quick something to help help someone do something very quickly um, uh, and that was pretty much the way in which they they functioned and they functioned as a support unit for uh, the four other units that I managed which were the the bigger more equipped and more sophisticated um, uh, investigative units the impact on the staff and the cost, um, chairperson and honourable member, uh, I really don't have words to tell you. I, you know, to get a message and a phone call at midnight that a spouse has attempted to commit suicide and the other spouse, first words to me is, I don't know whether I should contact the employer because I don't trust them or to walk into a household um, where uh, loving uh, two parents are um, at each other with a small child sitting in the room in the corner crying because of a newspaper article that the unit ran a brothel um, and trying to make peace in that household and being confronted with the reality that why would a big newspaper say so if it wasn't true? And why would the revenue service keep quiet if it wasn't true? Um, to um, situations where families split up completely um, and the effects on, on those children in those families and friends. Um, monetary costs, I, I, I can't even begin to give you a sense. Um, there are direct costs, of course, because it, it it comes with legal costs and so on. But I mean, even these three days have cost me money. Um, everybody else, I imagine, who's participating in this process, I'm getting paid to do what you do. Um, I'm not. I'm sitting here at own cost, um, and I have responsibilities, which is why I need to leave at three. Um, so uh, I can just tell you, it, it, it would be worth the while to um, have a look at cost of, of these things, um, perhaps in a broader sense and not the same in this type of committee. Um, what are the costs of people um, that have suffered as a res result of state capture? Not just the whistleblowers, but also other um, individuals and their families because the families and the children are the unheard, unknown, unthought of people. Thank you, Chairperson. 
and honorable member. Thank you, Mr. Van Lockenberg. I just want to come back to you because you've just mentioned the point. I know that you've got time limits. I just we can have squeeze, a... we can squeeze okay. our um... can I squeeze a few hands brief quickly. Thank you for your understanding. Uh, Mr. Mike Myham. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, I have I also, similar to Honorable Heron, have a few questions for Advocate Mkobane, which I will hold over to later. But Chairperson, with your indulgence, there's one simple clarity, a yes, no, that will, will guide me in my, my next question. Can I get can I ask that question of, of Advocate Mpofu and, and Advocate Mkobane? No, because of the time of no, it's Mr. just Van a simple Lofen. yes, no. It's very quick. Because it'll guide my it question. It might too. not be a yes or no, please. Because okay. he's 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 just it gave given us to squeeze a few hands. No, I understand that, Chair. All right, Chair. Um, my questions then are as follows. Uh, Mr. Van Lochrenberg, are you aware of the Nugent Commission report and what were its findings uh, with regard to the various issues uh, raised by the public protector in her report? Uh, as a follow-on to that, when was it issued and were the findings taken into account by the public protector? Then my next question is are any of the reports, and here I refer to Sikakwane, KPMG, the OIGI, or the press statement of the Kruen panel, of any evidentiary value in determining the legality or otherwise of the SARS unit under investigation? Uh, and following on to that, have any of those documents been allowed to stand unchallenged or without being discredited, disavowed, or set aside? My last question sort of follows on to what Honorable Sukas asked, and that's, are you aware of any deaths or poisoning caused by the operations of your SARS units? Um, and more specifically, are you aware of any form of physical harm caused to any person by your units or their members or their actions? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Mr. Van Lohrenberg. Chairperson and Honourable Member, yes, I'm aware of the Nugent um, Commission report. In fact, there were two reports. If I'm not mistaken, they dated uh, December 2018 and January 2019. Um, I might be off by a month. Um, yes, as far as I know, um, the Nugent report was put up uh, to uh, the public protector in respect of what um, was stated about the unit. Um, but I think the public protector did not necessarily attach too much value to it, um, if at all. Um, effectively, from what my reading of the uh, commission report is that uh, Judge Nugent that chaired that commission attempted to contact uh, Mr. Sikakane with a view to understand um, why he made that finding that the unit was unlawfully established and what was his rationale, but the effort came to naught um, for whatever reason. It's not all that clear in the report. It seems there was correspondence, but uh, no meaningful response. Um, the Sikakane report um, and the KPMG report and the Kanyane report and the Kruen press statement and the IGI report have no evidentiary value whatsoever for various reasons. The Sikakane report, um, because, it's, because of its status, um, it, it merely says, yeah, allegations, please investigate. Um, not, not, nobody testified on oath there except me. Um, I was the only person to submit uh, evidence on oath, which was not reflected in that report whatsoever. Um, KPMG has a report, has a massive disclaimer, specifically um, prohibiting the document from being used as evidence. Well, um, I mean, as, aside from the fact that the Kruen statement was um, recanted, um, um, uh, I think that's. I think it's the end of that because they, there was no investigation done. It's not evidence in the true sense. Um, and then, lastly, uh, the Inspector General of Intelligence report is as if it never has existed. It's um, void of uh, initio. Um, 
am I aware of any deaths or, 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 or physical harm or anything like that caused by people um, that I managed um, in, in, in my time at the South African Revenue Service? In a, in a general sense, absolutely no. Um, I made reference to one instance of the person with possession of illegal firearms and ammunition and rhino poaching. It wasn't in the context of his work. It was he actually this happened when he was on leave, and um, and in that case, I dealt with it. Um, and a, a disciplinary was held, and he took the matter to the CCMA, and ultimately um, he was dismissed. Um, the the docket disappeared with the police, and ultimately he was never prosecuted. But that's not something I had any control over. Thank you, Chairperson and Honourable Member. Thank you, Van Minen. Thank you very much, Honourable Chairperson. Uh, Mr. Van Lochenberg, I really just got two questions, and I want to get back to the golden thread that really runs through your affidavit and the crux of why we are actually here. Uh, am I correct in understanding that once the report came out, you were very surprised to find that despite your whistleblowing in 2016 and the emails that you sent, the information that you provided, in fact, none of that information was used in the subsequent report, and nobody from the unit had, in fact, been interviewed in pursuance of that report. Am I correct in understanding that? Thank you, Chairperson and Honourable Member. Correct. Yes. Okay. And then, you know, stemming from that and also stemming from Honourable Sukas's question, have you been surprised by how this has subsequently turned out by essentially what appears to be some kind of lawfare that's really been waged. Have you been surprised by the sort of ongoing campaign? No, Chair, Chairperson and Honourable Member. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Gondre. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Um, Mr. von Lorenberg, I'm going to ask you questions um, pertaining to your... Just try to raise your voice or come closer to the mic, okay. because I'm struggling to hear you. Are you? Oh, my apologies. Uh, Mr. Van Lohenberg, can you hear me? Yes, Madam. Uh, yes, Honourable Member. All right. I'm going to ask you questions. I just questions of clarity pertaining to your affidavit as well as um, your oral evidence before the committee. In paragraph 7.7 .7 of your affidavit, you state that the unit was known as the Special Projects Unit, the National Research Group, and the High Risk Investigations Unit. And my question is, why did the unit have... Uh, a number of names over the seven years of its existence. Is it because its purpose or functions were morphing or changing over time? And why, in your opinion, was the unit eventually disbanded in 2014? And I get the impression that it was gradually disbanded because it started with a staff complement of 26, according to you. And then by the time it was disbanded in 2014, it only had, um, you know, six members. And I wanted to find out what became of those, um, you know, um, members uh, that used to be part of that unit. And then you also stated in your oral evidence that the unit was consist consistently under attack as a result of the nature of its work, uh, the work that it was doing. And my question would be, please elaborate on this. And if you could maybe tie it into the 88 investigations that you mentioned during the course of your oral evidence that the unit um, conducted and were they uh, investigating uh, like high profile people, et cetera. I just want a bit more detail around why it could possibly have been, you know, consistent. you said consistently under attack. I think those were ex your exact words. And then you also stated in the oral evidence before the committee that um, during the course of um, the court proceedings, it became apparent to you, or it merged that advocate Makobani had in her position a classified version, version of the report of the Inspector General of Intelligence and not the redacted version of the report. Um, and I just want to get clarity on, because I, I heard you mentioning that the only way she could have had possession of this report was that um, it had been illegally obtained. In other words, um, the DG of the SSA could have been the only one who declassified the report. So I want to understand that um, whether you, you were surprised that she indeed had, you know, possession of this classified report when in actual fact it hadn't been declassified by the DG um, or by the minister. And um, 
And then my question becomes, why do you think she went through the trouble of having the meeting with um, Dr. Dean Dwe and, and um, the legal advisor of the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence at the time? I'm not entirely sure if she's still the legal advisor. That's Advocate Jay Governor. If, you know, if she was in position of, you know, this classified uh, version of, of, of the report and not the redacted version. Um, and then you state in paragraph 7.8 of your affidavit that prior to the publication of the report in 2019, um, Advocate Mukabani referred to the unit as a rogue unit. And I just want you to just please, um, you know, uh, elaborate on why you think this was the case. Why do you think she held this view um, that the unit was rogue uh, prior to uh, the release of the report in, in 2019? In other words, why was it a fair complete for her, even though she hadn't re released the, the report? Well, the rogue nature of, of the unit, that is. And then my last oh, question okay. is, okay. with respect to, to <laughs> you made reference to um, a fake intelligence dossier, um, namely Project Snowman in your oral evidence. And you stated that the dossier was compiled by a SARS official who was dismissed for rhino poaching and, and the illicit, illicit possession of firearms. You also made reference to um, Project Broken Arrow. Can you just um, take us in your confidence around the relationship between um, you know, the, the two projects, you know, Project Snowman and, and Broken Arrow? Thank you so much. Uh, it's almost a thesis of questions. Honorable uh, uh, Mr. Johan van Lachenberg. Okay, I'm, I'm pushing now. Um, yeah, okay. But okay, let me give it a go um, I, because I want to be um, respectful to the process and the questions. Yeah. Um, honorable member, um, why did the unit change names? Well, the, the short answer is really that SARS was undergoing tremendous modernization. Um, and so the unit actually refined its mandate. In fact, the mandate documents are in the court papers. They will tell you what the unit was mandated to do within the legal and policy framework of the South African Revenue Service. And as it refined, we realized um, we were moving away from something that we thought was special to something that was more akin to uh, research, um, and then ultimately um, I risk. So it, it's, it was just a, an ordinary thing, um, uh, and there was no particular um, reason for that um, per se. It, it was disbanded for reasons unknown to me. Uh, it was disbanded on instruction of Mr. Um, Tom Uyane, who was the commissioner of the Revenue Service at the time. Um, what happened to its members? Um, some of them remain in the employ of the Revenue Service, and they, uh, by all accounts, appear to be productive um, uh, uh, state uh, civil servants. Um, but the bulk of them have left the institution. I know a lot of them, many of them, especially those with good skills, are actually no longer living in South Africa. They're now um, living in other countries and they some of them are actually working for other governments um, in doing pretty much what um, they were doing for the South African Revenue Service but um, they I believe some of them are making good money uh, and I doubt we'll be able to see those kind of skills come back to the Revenue Service um, at the cost at which we had them um, it wasn't just the unit that came under attack it, as I said earlier, it was actually the division. The unit came under attack specifically from around 12 October 2014 onwards. And then it became a, like the, the label to hang everything, the whole propaganda uh, onto. And that's where this term rogue comes from. Um, I'm a little bit limited in respect of absolute detail in respect to the investigations that the unit conducted, the 81, not 88, honorable member and chairperson. Um, um, but I can tell you, I mean, to the extent that it's public knowledge, um, we were, for instance, looking at um, those 180 plus, some of them, of the 180 plus um, 
people from the State Security Agency and their front companies that you would have heard about uh, yesterday um, in that recording between the Inspector General and the Public Protector uh, as one example. And so some of them were our enemies, certainly, and they knew we were we were closing um, we were closing on them. We were also um, uh, uh, conducting investigations that were beginning to affect very influential people um, and, and, and politically connected people and politically exposed people and so forth, but also um, uh, very powerful and rich um, organized crime figures and, and groupings within the country. Um, there was a, I think so was a combination of that. Um, the, 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 indeed, it seems now to me that what I've learned today is that, as a fact, um, Ms. Mkwebane was indeed in possession of the classified uh, Inspector General of Intelligence report um, from at least 31 January 2019, uh, illegally so, unlawfully so. Um, why did she try to um, uh, have a declassified or whatever the case might be. I, I wouldn't want to speak for Ms. Mkwebane. I think it would be unfair to her. Um, if perhaps, perhaps this entire question is a question to be posed to her. I, I cannot read her mind, um, and, and I wouldn't want to. Um, The connection between Broken Arrow and Snowman is really that Project Broken Arrow appears to have been um, a, a sort of a, a session between people who had uh, beefs with uh, some people within the Revenue Service, like Mr. Gordon or Mr. Pillay and myself, or, or the institution itself. And they came together and met at coffee shops and had safe houses and uh, phones that weren't registered in their names and laptops and so forth that was being provided by people who were being investigated by the Revenue Service. And they then had all these different meetings and began to recruit people in order to compile what I think they called a file, which was intended to be given to the then state president with a view to then cause havoc and create chaos at the South African Revenue Service. So that they called Project Broken Arrow. And we know this because some of those people uh, uh, turned against their friends and came and reported that these things were going on. And each time they were asked, put it in writing, put it in writing. So a number of them reported these things and, and those documents date to that time. Um, and then, but subsequently, what came out of this, that file that Project Broken Arrow intended to create was then the document known as Operation or Project Snowman. Um, and it was first leaked to the media in 2009, and then um, early in, 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 in 2010, it, it, it began to reach other parts and other people um, with a view to try and popularize this document. Um, I hope I've answered all the questions. Thank you. Oh, the rogue unit question. Why, why, the, why Ms. Mpebane um, referred to the unit as a rogue unit before concluding the investigation? Um, well, I, I can conclude uh, I could conclude in no other way other than that she had already made up her mind at that point that the unit had been rogue for one reason or another. Um, but again, that's perhaps better that that question be posed to Ms. Mkwebane. Thank, Thank you, Chairperson you. and Honorable Member. I'm really um, at the tight end, uh, Chairperson. You'll just tell me. My two people. Yeah, you'll, yeah, you'll tell me when you have to leave. Thank you. Um, um uh, Mr. Nodada. Uh Angos uh, good afternoon to to everybody and good afternoon, uh, Mr. Lochenberg. 
Um, the questions I'm going to pose might, you know, seem rhetorical, but I think it becomes very important uh, for you to answer them directly. Mr. Lachenberg, your, your, your core complaint or your core submission or affidavit to us is around you wanting this committee to consider that uh, the public protector, or Ms. Mkwebana, um, failed to investigate without prejudice, bias, and was not being fair in giving you a hearing. And there were quite a few errors um, in that particular investigation, which ultimately um, made recommendations or what we call remedial actions that have implicated you. So the question I want to ask is what are these errors that you indicate represent prejudice, bias, and not providing you a fair hearing in coming to the conclusions that you did make? Sounds very rhetorical and seems that it's answered, but I think it's important for you to give context to that because you go as far as saying that for you, it's not the merits of which you are being questioned about, but rather the process that came to the conclusion of what you have been implicated to. The second question is, has there been any court of law or any legal body that has determined what you, um, the common cause of agreed with uh, advocate and Bofu, um, is the unit that has been called various names? Has there been any uh, law, uh, lawful institution in the country um, that you've approached that have determined this unit to be rogue um, in any form um, or has conducted any legal um, or unlawful work? And, and if so be the case, if you can provide details to that. My last question to you is this. There's been an indication that well, according to the version that has been uh, put by, by the public protector's uh, representative, that um, you may not be uh, been able to be found by um, investigators, whatever the case may be. Um, so my question to you is this. Do you accept that there could be any other alternatives that could have traced you as an implicated person in the investigation and what are those alternatives or avenues uh, that are available that you could have been uh, that could have been used by the public protector to ensure that you are then provided what you term as a fair uh, hearing or a unbiased or a unprejudiced um, uh, opportunity to represent what you have done subsequently um, in the courts? Thanks. Thank you. Please pro proceed, uh, Mr. Van Lachrenberg. Thank you, Chairperson and Honourable Member. Um, well, what were the errors? I, I highlighted all the errors in, in great detail in the, in the um, affidavits that served before court and the court succinctly identified them. It would take very long, Honourable Member, for me to list them right now. Um, but they range from uh, issues around the establishment of the unit to issues around how the unit actually functioned um, to issues around the equipment, which, which is wrongly attributed to this unit um, uh, in, in the broad. Um, and that's my point really, is that I, I believe had I been heard and had what I said been taken to heart, um, the report would have been very different to what you see today. Um, any court or any institution of any kind that's made any determination that the unit was so-called, um, that label rogue, um, no. Um, what we sit with is, 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 is the Sikakane report um, with which has been rejected by the South African Revenue Service, the KPMG report with all its um, problems, um, uh, the Inspector General report, which is as if it no longer, as if it never existed, 
and the Cruen statement. Um, in essence, those those are the the primary. Um, let's call them some sort of a formal process of some kind. Um, apart from the IGI one, all the others emanate from within the South African Revenue Service. Um, I couldn't be found. Well, I mean, I gave some examples in the affidavit. Oh, I think I could have been found. The most obvious would have been to just contact my attorneys with whom the public protector was in contact the three weeks prior to concluding the investigation. But there are many other ways. Um, I mean, she could have asked Mr. Pillay. She could have asked Mr. Mahashuna. She could have asked the South African Revenue Service. It was um, quite widely published that at that point in time, I was being charged um, and appearing before court. She could have asked the police. She could have asked the hawks. She could have asked the prosecuting authority. Um, she could have uh, made a plea in her um, YouTube statement issued in June um, to say, look, hey, um, von Lochenberg, you somewhere out there, you better come in because I've got some questions for you and I need some information from you. I, I can think of a myriad of ways in which it's, it could have been done. Um, uh, I would just bore you. Um, with, I've given you some examples. The bank, for instance, she indicated that she intended to investigate a bank account of mine. Uh, well, the bank has my details. The bank could have called me up for, because I'm required to comply with my FICA updates periodically. Um, so there are many, many ways to have gotten hold of me. Thank, thank you, Jefferson and Honorable Member. Uh, thank you, Honorable Chair. Maybe I must also start from uh, the point that uh, the questions to be posed to the witness may look like repetition, but I think uh, there's also an obligation on our side uh, as it relates to the directives under evidence 3.1, 3.2, so that is also understood that we're asking the questions to establish what we have been asked to establish as it relates to either misconduct or incompetence. So I just thought it's important to do that. Therefore, Chair, it, it may sound like personal, but I, I would really want to understand the grievance. And I want to start by saying that when you've had a relief from court, a what? A relief from court, I mean, from judgments okay. that would have been made uh, where you feel vindicated and you still come before the committee uh, and, and share with the committee. Of course, understanding that we are not another court. Um, so is, is, is there a reason, so, so that I, I, I clear my understanding, is the reason about assisting the committee as it relates to that 3.1, 3.2. Um, because at, at the end in the conclusions, I think that's what comes out, is that uh, in your affidavit, is that you have not been given the hearing. You make reference to the point that uh, even the public protector would have gone all out, including incurring costs to ensure that the uh, uh, is here uh, in the process. So, so do I have uh, that understanding uh, from yourself that you are not putting a new grievance because you've had relief uh, also from courts? So, so that's one point. The, the second point uh, for me, Chair, again, it relates to the same. And I'm, I'm raising this uh, cautiously because I had raised uh, earlier, uh, that as far as the recording, because I want to get to the recording, as far as the recording... Yeah, I have five minutes, sorry to be rude. Five minutes. Okay, yes, okay. I'll, I'll be done. That's why I'm saying I'm on the recording. I just wanted to put on the recording part uh, that I would raised an issue there of trying to confirm whether 
indeed i will be referring to the public protector in that uh, recording which you would have ruled chair that there would be an oath taken so i'm assuming that uh, there would be no problem in doing that at this point i just want to check again with regard to the recording is the point of the recording about the unlawfulness of the report from the inspector general of intelligence or is it about the ethical standards used by the public protector to get that report? Or is it the fact that that report was used as part of getting to uh, findings that the public protector would have made, or all of them are applicable? I, sub I submit, Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Van Lachrombeck. Thank you, Chair. Chair, the answer to, and honorable member, the answer to the first um, point is really, um, I responded to an invitation by this committee, which I imagine came from all of the members of this committee. Um, my motivation, I've stated to the extent I'm capable of expressing it in my affidavit. I should just maybe add that I'm hoping that since since um, our public protector, you know, we have nowhere to go if the public protector um, acts um, out of the ordinary or um, improperly or criminal or whatever the case might be, but to parliament, because um, that is where the public protector is um, accountable to. Um, so how do we assume for a moment and accept for a moment hypothetically that what I'm saying is true, that what occurred is indeed criminal and is indeed contrary to the public protective procedures and did affect the rights of individuals and so forth. And these abuses occurred and were perpetrated by the public protector. Assume for a moment that's right. Where do we as South Africans go to ensure that it won't happen again. And so whatever the outcome of this committee may be, I do hope that this is part of our broader constitutional democratic growth, because we really are a very young nation. Um, and we're part of those the generations that must contribute to the development so that those that come after us live in a better place. And um, so how do we help build and strengthen these institutions and make sure that they are uh, tamper-proof or shatter-proof or um, more, more robust in, in the way in which they go about doing their business? Um, On the recording, it's the, the short answer, Chairs, it's all of what, and an honorable member, it's all of what you've said, um, and of course more, and that we've learned today, um, which, is, which is that effectively the public protector used a document in an illegal possession to issue a report and make findings against people that had certain consequences um, and, and now we hear that she's had it and she never gave that document to anybody, um, um, at all to respond to or look at or anything like that. So it's, it's, it's all of the items that you've mentioned in short, chairperson and honorable member. Chairperson, I'm, I'm, I, I think there's one more person unless I'm wrong. Okay. Uh, I see two names. Um, Chairperson, I really have to go. I'm, I'm beyond my limit now. All right. Must I give you one more person now? I don't know if I, I'm past my five minutes. I, I, I'm, I'm in your aware of what, I, what my restraint is. And I'm in your hands. You just tell me now. You can change roles and you're the ones. I need to leave, Chairperson. I, I really need to leave. Let, I want I, to apologize, therefore, to the following three members Honorable Mkweba. Honorable Mawotwe, 
and Honorable Sheikh Imam. Those were the last three hands that uh, wanted to make a contribution. I sincerely want to apologize that we're not getting to you. And uh, therefore, let me take this opportunity to, to thank you um, very much, uh, Mr. Johan von Lochrenberg, for the three days you spent here. Um, and uh, the evidence leader, and uh, Advocate Mpof was a public protector legal team and uh, uh, fielding in the questions from the members. And we really appreciate your contribution and we hope that it, it will assist us in the work that we do. Uh, thank you very much. I don't want to hold you any longer because you, you, you have to do now what you have to do. But thank you very much on behalf of this committee. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Chair. Chair. Chairperson? Honorable Maute. Yeah, so what will happen to our questions that we couldn't post to Mr. Lagendek? Okay, just uh, uh, Advocate Bauer. Can I make a suggestion that they put it in writing and then ask Mr. Lagendek to answer them? Okay. Did you get that? Perhaps the three members can put those in writing and then they must be responded to by Mr. Van Lohrenberg. Thank you. Advocate uh, Pofo? Quick one, Chair. Yes, I, I agree with that. But I just wanted to remind you that we had reserved our rights to recall him. If we elect to exercise it, we'll let you know so that then those no questions problem. can be asked. Yeah. No problem. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Johan van Lohrenberg. You are now excused and released from the commission again by Danke. Thank you, Chairperson. Just a quick thank you to all the committee members and the legal representatives, including Mr. Mpofu. I understand um, cross-examination is a robust process. I again apologize if I offended you. Um, and thank you for the evidence leader. Um, and good luck to everybody involved in this process. I know it's something very new to our democracy. Um, and let us remember we only have each other. So let us um, please um, look after each other. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Van Lachenbeck. All the remarks directed at me, at least. No hard feelings. And uh, if I offended you, I also apologize to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's where we close it there. Thank you, Chair. I'm now going to recognize uh, Ms. Fatima Ibrahim. Um, I do immediately so that we don't waste any time. Uh, want uh, to to quickly um, so that those very brief uh, interactions that members wanted to make or questions, um, because uh, Honourable Maneli would have wanted to know whether the public protector can confirm this is her voice, uh, and Honourable Heron at the register as well as. Uh, I think the other member, I, I can't do can't go hold Nazik. Please. Um, so I would want us to, as I indicated, that she can quickly do that, but uh, I think uh, she must be, it must be done under oath. And I'm now going to recognize Fatima Ibrahim to, to help us deal with that. Um, good afternoon, Chair, and good afternoon to all the um, members and persons um, sitting in the committee and on the platform today. Um, Chairperson, I will now proceed um, to swear Advocate Mkwebani in. Good afternoon, Advocate Mkwebani. Can you hear me clearly? Please uh, take your mic, uh, Honorable Mkwebani. I'm an mean, Advocate Mkwebani. Sorry, what's happening now? What do you mean, what's happening? No, I, I mean that. Well, what's actually happening? Uh, members, there are members who wanted to ask a few questions from Advocate Mukwebane yesterday. Okay. From her directly? Yes. No, well, okay. Oh, I see. Is yes. that rule where we can take them down and answer yes. in seven days? Okay. And 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 therefore I did I, I did not want that to happen before she takes an oath. Uh, well, I can tell you now, Chair, there's no need for you to do that because we can ask it to take an oath, of course, if you have time. But she, the whatever questions are going to be asked, we will note them and invoke that rule in the directives. Yeah, but members are going to ask the questions. 
Of course. And I, I want that uh, she takes an award. Up to you, Chair. Thank you. Fatima Ibrahim. Um, Chairperson, I just wanted to clarify that in terms of the directives, um, as they now stand, uh, the public protector can request um, that an answer be deferred and that you can make a ruling on whether you agree or not, depending on the nature of the question and whether it can be answered now. Um, this is an oversight process and members have the right um, to ask uh, the public protector to answer questions. I just wanted to clarify that, but in any event, I'll, I will proceed with the oath. Um, Advocate Mkwebani, can you please state your full name for the record? Um, Ma'am, you have been invited subject to the provisions of six, Section 16 of the Powers, Privileges and Immunities of Parliament and Provincial Legislatures Act 2004 to appear before this committee and to answer questions in respect of the committee's inquiry into your removal as public protector. Please be informed that by law you are required to answer fully and satisfactorily all the questions lawfully put to you or to produce any document that you are required to produce in connection with the subject matter of the inquiry, notwithstanding the fact that the answer or the document could incriminate you or expose you to criminal or civil proceedings or damages. You are, however, protected in that evidence given under oath or affirmation before a House or committee may not be used against you in any court or place outside Parliament, except in criminal proceedings concerning a charge of perjury or a charge relating to the evidence required in these proceedings. Please be aware further that in terms of Section 17.2 of the Powers Act, a person who willfully furnishes a house or committee with information or makes a statement before it which is false or misleading commits an offence and is liable to a fine or to imprisonment for a period not exceeding two years. You will now be required to take an oath or affirm that the evidence you are about to give is truthful. You may choose to take either the oath or affirmation. Which do you prefer? I will take an oath as the child of God, yes. Thank you, ma'am. Can I please ask you to raise your right hand and repeat after me? I swear that the evidence I shall give. I swear that the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Shall be the truth and the whole truth and nothing else. And nothing but the truth, so help me God. But the truth, so help me God. Um, thank you, Advocate McCorbani. You will be sworn in for the duration of these um, hearings. Chair, um, we have now sworn in Advocate McCorbani. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Fatima Ibrahim, and thank you to the public protector. Um, I had uh, noted uh, Honorable Maneli, Honorable Heron, um, and there are others who are getting provoked. Honorable Mylam, I did note you. And it's a theater no Um Sheikh Imam, uh, quickly in that order, uh, no data. Sukas. Uh, okay. Maneli, please. No, thank you, Chair. As, as I said, uh, Chair, for further questioning later, I just wanted to be at least on record yeah. uh, that the public protector agrees that that voice uh, is actually here and would have been aware of of that. Um, I think it's important so that when you come back to questioning, uh, that could be clarified. Uh, that, that's really that's really that, Chair. Uh, Thank because you. it affects everything else we would ask about that report. Thank you. Thank you very much. Advocate Mkwaba. Um Thank you, Honourable Member uh, Chaperson. Yes, I can confirm that uh, that meeting um, took place, hence the recording was availed in court. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Mukwebane. Honourable Heron. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, I have about four or five questions all related to the same thing. Shall I pose them one at a time or? 
or five? I'll, how, I'll, how would an advocate I'll, include? I'll check them? if uh, what she's comfortable with, all of them, or one one. We can ask all of them, and then sure. um, we will record them. Okay. Uh, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Um, I, I guess I'm seeking clarity around the possession of the Inspector General report or the intelligence report, the classified document, um, which I, I mean, I understand it's a criminal offence, and I think you said so in the recording um, where you said you shouldn't have the report and it is a criminal offence to have the report. So I, I, my first question, and I'm sure, Advocate, you can ask this, answer this, um, even though it's perhaps a little wider than your scope, given that you are, I think you have some intelligence experience as well. I mean, what is a, an, an ordinary South African meant to do if they receive anonym, anonymously dropped off at their office an intelligence report that is classified? What is, I mean, what is the obligation on, if, if someone wants to drop a report at my office, I don't think I'm special as a member of parliament, what, what is my obligation with regards to that report? And my second question, which is, is related, is as the public protector, what is the obligation to do with that report? Is there, um, does the public prot protector have an extra duty of care with regards to receiving an anonymous classified report? Or does, does the public protector have the same obligation that an ordinary South African has with regards to how you handle receiving a report that you didn't perhaps ask for? The third question is, did the public protector do what is required of the law if you receive a report anonymously, which is classified and it's now illegally in your possess possession? Um, fourthly, is there any, any reason why the public protector could not disclose in Report 36 of 2019-2020 that she had received a report anonymously, that the possession of it was illegal, and this is what she did with it? Um, there, there appears to be an omission that that this report was actually in um, in your possession, um, and if if there was no reason for you not to do that, why is that not in the report? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Heron. Advocate Mukwebane. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, with the advice of my legal counsel. Um, we request that we respond in writing. Thank you. Thank you. That's that's fair. Honorable Sheikh Imam. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Chairperson, uh, before I ask this question, I just wanted some clarity. In the case of Mr. Lochenberg, now that we're going to send him questions in writing, does he still enjoy the same privileges and protection as if he's appearing before this committee? Uh, it's just something for you to think about. Okay, my 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 first question is this, uh, 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 to Mr. Spukubani. You've heard um, what uh, Mr. Lochenberg has been saying time and time again, and that he's never been given an opportunity, no questioning, despite all him requesting it. You've had access to his information to 20 different sources, but made absolutely no attempt to even question him. Do you believe that if you had done that, we may not have been here today, which might result in us saving millions of rands of taxpayers? That's the first question that I have. Okay. On the issue of the so-called rogue unit, I'd rather call it a rogue unit because my understanding is it might have not been set up lawfully. But at the same time, will you agree with me that while it might not have been set up lawfully, there is no law in the country that says it's unlawful for a structure like SARS to put up this unit if they have reasonable grounds to believe that indeed we have illicit trade, illicit economy, but there is great risk to the country. Uh, so that's my second question. Would you agree with me then that while it was not lawfully structured, it is not unlawful uh, or illegal for a unit like SARS to put something, if they want to particularly protect the interest uh, of the country. And, and then lastly, you know, besides not uh, 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 giving an opportunity to listen to Mr. Lochenberg, who has been implicated, his name is in the report, he was at the forefront of this unit. When the whistleblowers came forward and you had access to the report, did you at any time give thought to the fact that indeed 
there must be something wrong in the country, particularly on the issue of state capture. And that in the interest of the country and the public who has the trust and confidence in the office of the public protector, that you need to thoroughly investigate this and ensure that you do justice to your office by protecting the country. And I'll stop there, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sheikh Imam. Advocate um, Kwebane. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable uh, Sheikh. Um, um, yes, uh, I will also still on this one with the advice by the advice of my uh, legal team, uh, prefer to respond in writing. Oh, thank you. Honorable Mike Myra. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, before I ask my question, I'd like to draw your attention to Rule or Directive 5.9, um, which says that a member of the committee, either directly or through the evidence leaders, may ask advocates in Kobani directly to respond to certain questions posed orally or in writing, including factual disputes that may arise, even if she is not at that time giving evidence. Advocate in Kobani must respond to such questions immediately unless she requests a reasonable period of time within which to submit a response. Chairperson, I'm not aware that such a request has been made. She said that she wants to, to respond in writing, but the, the directive is that she needs to respond immediately unless she requests a reasonable time frame. We haven't been given a time frame and we haven't been, been um, requested that, that uh, she be exempted from the requirement to, to respond immediately. So before I ask any questions, could I get a ruling from you in that regard? Okay, thank you. I, I, I was going to do that at the end, but uh, maybe let me hear her request first. Honorable, I mean, Advocate Mkweban. Thank you, Chairperson. Chairperson, I would uh, plead with you and the committee to give me an opportunity to respond in writing, and um, you can indicate how many days you expect um, us to to respond mm. um, again to make sure that um, yeah. one is within um, and I'm also um, not, um, you know, mentioning information which is not possibly true or which is not there. So I would prefer that I respond in writing. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, I, I will. I will impose the time at the end, uh, uh, Honourable Mylan. Okay. Thank you, Chair. She has not indicated in terms of the preference on time. Yeah, Chair. Thank you. I, I'm. I'm not clear as to the reason why she is re uh, requesting the uh, opportunity to to respond in writing. It's not as if she can't answer the questions. I mean, if, if it was a question that she needs to go and look up, that's a different But yeah, we can't be abused Sorry. here. You made a ruling. Why Sorry, is this chair. member coming back again? You made a ruling, Chair. Can we move? Okay. Th 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 thank you, Honorable uh, uh, Maute. There's a member on the platform. Please co conclude. Thank you, Chairperson. I, I'm, as I was saying, I'm not clear as to why she is not answering the simple questions of, of, of fact that are in her knowledge. If she needs to go and research something, that's a different story. But if it's a simple question of fact that's in her knowledge, she should be able to answer the, the question immediately. I, I just need okay. some clarity in that regard. Can I, can I rule that you ask your questions? Okay. I, I, I indicated I will impose the time because I, I have no reason to, to, to doubt the reasoning. Okay. Uh, Advocate in Kobane, and, and perhaps, uh, well, no, let me ask you this simple yes no question. Are Sienejo attorneys your private attorneys, or are they the attorneys of the institution of the public protector? No, no, I'll, I'll uh, wait okay. for an answer on that. Okay, uh, just switch off uh, Advocate Mbofo, Advocate Mkwebane. I will defer and answer it in writing. Chair, with the greatest of respect, uh, I'm sorry, that, that's a simple yes, no question. Are they your private attorneys or not? It's not something that needs to be written in writing. But okay, if that's the way we're going to play this, it is a clear attempt at, at uh, delaying tactics, but okay. No, Chairperson, please. Mr. Milan. I mean, honestly, 
please Chair, refrain I'm, from making I'm such a remark. Chairperson, I'm entitled within the Powers and Privileges Act to make a statement, express an opinion, and not be held to order by advocates in Porfu or anyone else. This is my opinion, that we are being subjected to delaying tactics. Person. And I stand on my, my privileges as a member of parliament, as a member of this house, to make such a statement. I will continue. Chairperson. Okay. Just, just pause, Advocate Mboff. Thank you, Chairperson. Yes, uh, the Honourable Member is correct. In Within the precinct of parliament, anyone can do anything, even if, um, if it amounts to criminal activity, uh, in terms of Section 58 of the Constitution. But that's not why I'm rising to a person. I also have a right to represent my client, if you don't mind. The issue I'm raising is a very simple one. The Honorable Member must ask the rules within the parameters of the directive. There's no way in the directive, which he has just read to you, where it says that Advocate Nkobana must give reasons for anything. Whether the question is one sentence or one hundred sentences or one alphabetical uh, syllable. It doesn't matter. Thank you. Honorable Mailam. Chairperson, I'm going to continue with the questions that that uh, I had written down here. Uh, my first question is, if, as Advocate Mpofu suggests, that the individual, in other words, Advocate Mkwebane, and the institution are the same, which he made that suggestion on Tuesday. Why would Sianejo attorneys respond to correspondence from Mr. Van Lochrenberg? And my question was premised on the fact that Sianejo attorneys are her private attorneys and not the attorneys of the institution of the public protector which is why I asked a very simple question and, and tried to get clarity on that, but I was being frustrated, Chair. Chairperson, I, I would like to know why the public protector did not engage Mr. van Lochrenberg before issuing her report. I know that uh, other people have asked it in a similar uh, or similar question, but I'd like to know why she did not. Um, there was a suggestion from Advocate Mpofu that Mr. van Lochrenberg was not an implicated person in terms of the of Report 36. Do you agree with that, Advocate Mkwebane? My, my follow-up to that is, if a person is implicated, are they not enti entitled to, to have their, their side of the story heard? And again, going back to my previous question, why did you not then do so? As a follow-up, is it not normal practice when you're doing these kinds of investigations and serving legal documents and the, the, the like uh, to serve formal documents on a person's attorneys? In this particular instance, why did you not do so? With regard to the YouTube video that we heard yesterday, in that video, Advocate Mkobani, you say you are not targeting anyone. Those are the words that you used. You are not targeting anyone. How do you reconcile that with Advocate Mpofu's questions to Mr. van Lochrenberg that Minister Gordon was, and I quote, the primary target of the investigation? Then... I'd like your opinion on, on something, please, Advocate Mkubane. Is it the suggestion of you and your team that the mere existence of this unit at SARS makes it unlawful? And again, how do you reconcile that with the various court judgments in this regard? Advocate Mpofu made much of the, the fact that... I, I'm just sorry to interrupt you, Honourable Member. Can you, if you can just... This last one, sorry, I just missed something. I said, the question was, is it the suggestion of Advocate Mkubane and her team that the mere existence of this unit at SARS makes it unlawful? 
And how is that reconciled with the various court judgments in this regard? Then Advocate Mkubane, uh, Advocate Mpofu made much of the fact that out there, South Africans think about a rogue unit. And my question to you is, does it matter what people out there think? Is it not a matter of fact and a matter of law as to whether or not there is such a unit? And further, that those facts have been determined by various courts of the land. Lastly, and, and this is to follow on to what Honorable Heron asked, with regard to the Inspector General of Intelligence report, what did you do with the copy that you claimed to have found in your reception? Furthermore, how can you rely on a report that came into your possession unlawfully? And lastly, how can you claim to have been impartial or unbiased in your report if you have not afforded the persons that are implicated by that IGI report an opportunity to review it? Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Honorable Mayhan, Advocate Mukulwane. Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. Um, I would also request that we respond in writing at the ad, um, after the advice of my team, um, my legal team. Thank you. Honorable Sukas. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Advocate Mkwebane, I just have a few questions and let me also state to you that you certainly have my empathy for having to appear before a committee this size and it must be hard. And so you really have my empathy with that. I um, want to ask you, do you believe that you should take responsibility for the omissions of your staff and the actions of your staff? And then uh, Mr. Ibrahim spoke on Monday, the need for the public protector to be accessible and that this is an active role. Mr. Van Lochenberg is what I think, and I Googled him yesterday, uh, uh, what we can call a public figure. You also had his lawyer's details. What more should you have done or your office to ensure that his rights were upheld? and that he, was her, that he um, had the opportunity to be heard. You stated in public that the special investigation um, or the high-risk unit was a rogue unit and indicated that people had died prior to the conclusion of an investigation. When his lawyers asked you not to do this, you stated through your lawyers and said you would not do so and that he should sue you. Given that only very wealthy individuals in this country or members, and that members of the public cannot afford um, public um, representation, um, afford lawyers uh, to, to, that would be able to defend them in that way, um, and that you have the, the unlimited resources, almost unlimited resources of the state at your disposal, do you think that this was fair and that it granted access to such an individual? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Sukas. Advocate Mukwane. Thank you, Chairperson and Honorable Member. I will also uh, prefer to respond on this in writing. Thank you. Honorable Mutada. Thanks, Chair. I think I've been largely covered by uh, Honorable Milan. But I just want to ask two specific questions to the advocate Mukwebane. Uh, we just had a witness here, uh, Mr. Lochenberg, in the past two days. 
and his uh, uh, premise of his uh, contribution to this committee is that uh, you fail to conduct the investigation without prejudice, your bias in the errors in your uh, investigation. Uh, Chair, I would like to submit, um, whether through the evidence leader or through you, Chair, um, a list of uh, those errors that are uh, alleged that uh, the public protector had um, made in, in the process and for her to uh, respond um, individually to each error since she will respond in writing um, in many instances unless she is able to uh, respond here physically. The second question, Chair, relates to uh, two things. One, there's, you know, there, there's been a question, there's been two questions posed regarding um, locating Mr. Lochenberg. One of them is the assumption that, you know, if you misspelled, you know, a surname, then there might be, a, you know, a challenge of finding him one. The second one is to indicate that there may be investigative officers that had been given the responsibility to go find Mr. Lochenberg. If this is the case, or these were the challenges of uh, not being able to afford Mr. Lochenberg, what he alleges uh, to be a fair hearing, um, is there proof in this regard that these particular investigators uh, were given the responsibility to go find Mr. Lochenberg, and they then did so and then reported back that uh, they were unable to find uh, Mr. Lochenberg, um, and whether uh, the, the public protector, Ms. Mkobane, uh, can indicate what other mechanisms are used in her investigative process to ensure that they locate um, individuals that may be implicated in what she is investigating as a public protector, to ascertain what mechanisms are actually used to ensure that people are given um, a fair chance to represent themselves in whatever investigation is taking place. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Madada, Advocate Mkwabane. Thank you, Chairperson and Honorable Member. Yes, um, I will still also, with the advice of my legal team, request to respond in writing. But just to clarify, the list of errors, um, do you know which uh, pages of the engagement so that we can I know Mr. Van Lohrenberg responded, but um, did you capture which page or the evidence leader will help us? He indicated that he's going to share. Is that what you said? Yeah, Chair, I'm, I'm going to share Mr. Lohrenberg's response was to say that it's documented in various judgments that support his, yeah, his affidavit. And that's what I'm going to uh, extract from that and share uh, sure. uh, to request. So at this moment, there's no specific... Uh, he, well, that that's going to be a follow up information given to to the committee and yourself. In okay, in writing, yes. And I I think on the issue of whether we've tried and mechanisms which we've tried to locate Mr. Van Lochrenbeck, um, yes, um, there is proof and there's evidence, and uh, we will call some of the witnesses who were the investigators to before this committee when we present our evidence. Thank you. Thank you, Advocate Mukwebane. Honorable Kondwe. I have, believe it or not, only four questions this time. I only have four questions this time, ne? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, Advocate Mukwebane, um, my question is around the my question, uh, well, three of my questions are around the meeting that you had with the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence. Um, and I want to find out whether the Office of the Inspector uh, General of Intelligence was aware of the fact that you were recording the meeting at the time. That's my first question. And then you attached a copy of the transcript of the meeting um, mm -hmm. with the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence to the court papers pertaining to, I think it's the 2020 court action. Was the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence aware that you had attached the transcript to those court papers? And then um, 
the PIA Act and the Intelligence Services Act make it unlawful for anyone to have in their possession classified documents. So my question is, and it, it touches on what um, Honorable Heron raised, was that um, if you are in possession and you, and I think you've, you've, well, through your counsel, you've indicated that you are in possession of the classified um, report of the Office of the Inspector General of Intelligence. Did you take steps to inform the relevant authorities that you were in possession of this report, which was classified in its nature because it had not been declassified by the DG or by the Minister of State Security at the time? Then my last question is that you indicate in the 2019 report on the unit that you have it on good authority that there was a covert unit in SARS utilizing covert and intrusive methods. Um, I just want an explanation on the authority that you based this finding on, um, because you said you have it on good authority. Is it based on what? I'm not entirely sure. So, um, and I wanted clarity on whether you were making this assertion on the basis of the classified um, report of the Office of the Inspector General on Intelligence. That is good. Thank you, Honorable Gonde. Advocate Mkweban. Thank you, Chairperson. Still on the advice of my legal team, I will respond in writing. Thank you, Advocate Mkweban. Uh, uh, Honorable Ompile Maute from the virtual. Thank you very much, Chair. Chair, mine is not to advocate Mkweban or advocate Dalimpuf. It's just to bring to the attention of this committee that uh, Honorable Mayhem is actually the husband of Mrs. Mazzoni, who is the complainant. And we've been seeing throughout the day how he has been harassing Advocate Dalimpov. Um, and so it, it, it is kept Mautu. on the, the biasness. Honorable Mautu. The bias. Honorable so Mautu. My, my appeal is perhaps you should be... Mautu, I want you to stop. You're out of order. I want you to, to, to refrain from that. But I, you I, have not heard my question, Chair. I was uh, just giving the background. I, I, I actually want you to withdraw what you've just said. No, I won't withdraw anything. What am I withdrawing? I'm going to repeat. Honorable Mautu, I want you to withdraw what, what? you've just said. Withdraw what? Honorable Mautu, the third time. I want you to what withdraw. What am I withdrawing, Chairperson? I'm asking you a question. What must I withdraw? IT, please remove Honorable Mautu from What must book. I withdraw, Janji? What is it that I must withdraw? Please it's remove the fact that Mayhem is the husband of Mazzoni. Mazzoni is a complainant. That's why we are sitting here. And he has been the harassing the arms and IT. Please the remove it's a fact. Honorable Mautwe from the platform. This is not your, your meeting, uh, Chairperson. This, we're, we're all part of this meeting. I'm a member of this committee. Where, and I cannot be treated IT? like I'm a stepchild in this meeting. Can you remove Honorable Mautwe from the platform? Who's responsible for that? Thank you. Honorable Manelli. No, thank you, Chair. Um, I think initially when I, I raised the question, I thought there would be an opportunity to get back because I had indicated that the questions I wanted to ask relate to the recording. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now that they are noted, I thought it would be important to just place them now uh, and that they can be noted and responded to. <clears throat> I, I think the, the other question has already been asked, uh, uh, Chair, but I want to ask it uh, differently in that just to be sure also that I'm referring to the same report that is referred to that the public protector would have issued. <clears throat> that in the source documents used to get to the findings or the investigation itself, uh, there is no mention of that report uh, that has been received. Uh, instead, I did see a letter from the public protector to the to that office of the uh, intelligence, uh, the inspector general of intelligence, as well as response as document cited, not the actual report. I just want to check uh, there, Chair, whether this would have been on the basis of the understanding that that report would have been a classified report. And if that would be the case, why use it then in the body of uh, the, 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 the report itself uh, that she issued? So, so that's one. The second thing is just an understanding. 
in the recording, as I listened, there was a point made about uh, conclusiveness of the report. I think words used were that to connect the dots, you will then still need to engage uh, people in, uh, in SARS. Uh, now, I just wanted to check if that would have happened uh, so, so that we know how the conclusions later uh, would have been uh, arrived at, uh, right? So, so, so I think that's that's the point there. And 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 maybe again, as I said, in mentioning the report, whether then this report would have been legalized later, because I think uh, Honorable Heron would have raised this point, if not disclosed that the report would have not been sourced properly. Uh, but of course, you'd have had sight of it because you received it in one way or the other. But at least uh, do that, <laughs> because this goes back to what uh, we dealt with when uh, Mr. Ibrahim talked to standards and so on. So it's it's a linked question in that score. Thanks, uh, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Maneli. Advocate Mkwabane. Chairperson, um, I will also, with the advice of my legal team, respond in writing. Thank you, um, Advocate Mkwabane. That was the last uh, uh, interaction on, on the questions. As you have indicated that, uh, which we accept, that you will do all of this in writing. I just want going to indicate that uh, we are going to expect that uh, we receive those uh, in seven days time. And that's a timeline that I will be imposing uh, for, and I take into account the work that you are going to be busy with outside of this process. So thank you very much. Um, honorable members and colleagues, I had indicated, Honorable Sukas, you, 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 you want to say something before I proceed? From? Okay. Che, my concern is just that I think, and Che must help me, yeah? Um, we are giving Honorable um, Advocate Mkwebane the opportunity, according to the directives, to give that response. The witnesses that are going to appear before us are they having the same latitude? Um, because are we then fair? That is my question. Is it a fair process to anybody else who comes before the committee? Okay. Those are the directives that we agreed to. Uh, let's not go back there now. Yeah, people must learn to read. Please. Uh, uh, Honorable Malema, please refrain. Let, let... It's a question of fairness. It's and not I... a question of literacy. No, don't respond to that, Honorable Sukas, please. Uh, thank you. But the directives are written. The directives are written. Read. You should have Honor questioned them at that time. Honorable uh, Van Minen. Thank you, Chair. Chair, um, in terms of Section 5.9 of the directives, it in fact states that um, the chairperson shall determine a reasonable time frame. Uh, and then goes on to talk about ensuring that the committee is able to properly fulfill its mandate and carry out its oversight function. And I think in line with that and in line with what the Honorable Sukas has said, we really must um, ensure that we are not allowing any particular individuals more latitude than other individuals because the directives bind the entire committee and we have to ensure there's a quality of treatment of all parties concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Fran Minen. The chairperson has applied his mind and has given a reasonable time of seven days. Thank you. Matter closed. Can I therefore proceed now to what I wanted to say? So we would have indicated earlier on that we had an intention to have um, Mr. Pillay having evidence led but we're not able to do that. Because in any case, if we would have started with Mr. Pillay, we would not have been able to do the interactions with him on Tuesday, on Monday and Tuesday. Because Monday and Tuesday is almost sacrosanct. We can't change it. We have a, a witness that has been subpoenaed and we're not going to change that date 
for Monday and Tuesday. And therefore, there's going to be an amended program in that regard. And perhaps I can recognize Advocate Bauer, just if there's anything you want to say in relation to Monday and Tuesday. Because we, we as I indicated in the morning, um, Tuesday, from Tuesday, we'll take a pause of five days. And when we come back from that Wednesday, it is going to be a hectic process uh, going forward. Advocate Bauer? If, if you have any comment you want. No, no, Chief. Thank you very much. If, if there's none, therefore, colleagues. Yeah. Chair, I apologize. Uh, we are about to adjourn. We are about to adjourn the, the meeting. Yes. Chairperson, uh, could I request that the, the committee not adjourn, but that we just stay and talk as committee members about some of the processes and procedures that have been... I have already indicated in your absence when I started that there's a meeting we have next week, just as a committee between Wednesday and Thursday, and that is, that is going to be confirmed. And the purpose of that is to iron out any committee issues that we have Chair, I, I accept that absolutely. Um, however, my concern is that we have at least two days of hearings before those processes are ironed out. Chairperson, so I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to say that we we should try and iron out any issues we have now before we go into another two days of hearings. Okay, I don't know what those issues would be, but let's just pause. Honourable Malema. Chair, earlier on, you see, we're not going to operate like this where people just get um, uh, provoked uh, time and again and then want to change the program of uh, this committee. You indicated that we'll have Monday and Tuesday with the public protector virtually, and then we'll have Wednesday to ourselves. So there is nothing agent here, Chair. People must not be provoked here by other things. And then what we adopted the directives, we're working within the directives, and we're going to proceed as such. Husbands must not come here and get irritated by our proceedings okay. here. Thank you, Honorable Malema. Please, I want you to, to, to refrain from, from that language. Honorable members, unless there's an insistence, I do want to request that, uh, as I indicated, that we have set aside a day for a committee meeting. And, and we'll deal with quite a number of issues, including whatever concerns that members would have. Thank you for that for, and for your attention and patience. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Long leave the chair. Recording stopped. <laughs>